here I will take the liberty of discussing proteins the way I used to discuss them. And there are just so many ways of grouping and classifying them that it's impossible to have one best way of doing so. And, and I will uh, do it by shape first, followed by composition, and followed by function. Do note that these things may overlap, and sometimes you can classify proteins by all of these methods. Let's start by shape, and when we use the word by shape, we have two main classifications of proteins. The first one is the globular class, which obviously from the word globe, has a globe-like or sphere-like shape. Now, assuming that the protein that we are discussing right here is something that is in water medium, we should assume that the polar residues or R groups are facing the outside because they would interact perfectly with water, and the nonpolar ones, which are hydrophobic, would stay hidden inside. And examples of globular proteins are globulin, that's easy, and albumin. These are actually what we call plasma proteins because we find them in plasma or in blood, which makes sense because the medium of blood is water and uh, the proteins must be water-soluble, such as these globular proteins. Whereas the fibrous proteins are much less water-soluble because from the word fibrous, they exist as long um, strands and they have their nonpolar residues exposed. And moreover, if they are laid out like that in a flat position, just like a thread, they start to have very large molecular weights that they become even less water-soluble. So we can pretty much assume that the fibrous proteins are much, much less water-soluble compared to the globular proteins. And in fact, structural proteins are prime examples of fibrous proteins, which I will discuss a little more in detail later. Now, by composition, we have simple, conjugated, and derived. Now, you may be asking, what's the point of asking proteins by composition? Aren't all proteins or peptides composed of amino acids? That is actually only partially correct. The proteins that are made up only of amino acids are called the simple proteins. And if you ask, what can, what can other proteins be? What's the other possibility? You can actually have what you call conjugated proteins, wherein you have amino acid plus something else, right? It doesn't mean that proteins are made up of amino acids. It means that all proteins have amino acids only, right? For example, if I have the word glycoprotein, it's basically protein with sugars in it. A prime example of a glycoprotein is an immunoglobulin, which I actually discuss later because it's literally written here. But these are actually defense proteins. Lipoproteins are things which we have already discussed in lipids, if you actually uh, watch that, which include, of course, the very low-density lipoprotein, low-density, high-density, and the rest. I have discussed this further before in, in, in terms of what they are supposed to do. Nucleoproteins are proteins with nucleic acids, particularly DNA. And when we discuss in detail the structure of the DNA, I will repeat this word again. So basically, these are very long DNA strands that are wrapped around, or they wrap, they wrap around globular proteins called histones. And when I go to the nucleic acids, I will explain why we have to have something like this in the first place. Now, we also have, for example, chromoproteins, which are proteins with a non-protein portion that absorbs light and gives it some kind of color. The prime example for humans and animals is hemoglobin, which is basically Globin, this is the protein part, with heme. Heme is actually not a protein part, but it's an organic molecule. And the heme molecule is responsible for giving hemoglobin the red color, which we can assume is that which gives the red color to our blood. Now, regardless if I have a simple or conjugated protein, they can be converted to derived proteins, and derived proteins have been modified chemically, usually by hydrolysis meaning they have been partially destroyed, but it actually uh, 
converts them to some protein which has a different function. For example, derived proteins are actually active forms of some proteins that are usually inactive under uh, default conditions. Pepsinogen, for example, is one of the proteins in our body, uh, specifically in the gastrointestinal tract, that will not activate as long as the pH of the stomach is not too low. For example, imagine you ate food, significant amounts of food, that would trigger some physiologic functions that will increase hydrochloric acid in our stomach. And actually, the increased acidity of the stomach would be enough to you know, cleave or remove some parts of pepsinogen to become pepsin. This is actually the active form of the, the, the protein which is responsible for digesting the proteins that we eat in food. Fibrinogen, on the other hand, is one of the most important clotting factors because it is the last one in the clotting or the coagulation cascade. When a certain other clotting factor called thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin, this will lead to a solid and uh, uh, hard fibrin clot, which is the clot that we know of in layman terms. Okay? So they are actually the active forms, and that's what makes derived proteins somehow significant. Now, we also can uh, classify proteins by function, and in fact, we've been doing that in these. We just were not, you know, um, saying it right out. For example, I could actually say that lipoproteins are transport proteins in a way. You know, immunoglobulins are, are defense. So hopefully, you know, before I go uh, to the individual functions, you already get the point that we can really classify proteins by any of these uh, categories or methods. Now, before I also go further, I have a note here. It's written here. Proteins function only in their so-called native conformation. So, to clarify that, when you say that the protein is in its native conformation, it is in its, let's say, proper folding. For example, usually we can imagine this is basically a protein in its proper posture or its proper position, just like the way it should be. When you say the way it should be, it actually depends on the gene that it encodes it. In our DNA, there's a specific part of our genetic code that codes for that certain protein. And that will dictate if the protein is supposed to be made of how many amino acids, if it should be globular or fibrous, if it has to be conjugated with something, and, and so on. And um, basically, the native conformation is anything as long as it's the one intended for it by our genes. Okay, now we go to the structural proteins. And I did mention that Fibrous proteins, structural proteins are the prime example. And these are the proteins that give framework to our body, specifically the connective tissues, our skin. You can just imagine collagen, which is a very popular word. It makes up a lot of our skin and a lot of our connective tissue as well, which basically means it covers our body from head to toe. Elastin, which gives some kind of elasticity or flexibility to some parts of our organs. And keratin, which is uh, relatively harder. And we can find keratin in other places like our hair or our nails. So as long as it's, you know, it's something you can imagine that makes up our body. You can see it from the outside. It gives some kind of framework and integrity to our uh, build those are the structural proteins. And obviously, these are water-insoluble. Of course, you can't imagine your skin dissolving after taking a bath, right? Now, signaling proteins are usually receptors. And uh, I don't want to discuss this too much because this would uh, fall on pharmacology territory. But uh, I did mention receptors when I was talking about uses of carbohydrates. Receptors are basically molecules. And this time, I'm talking about proteins. Proteins that... Um, will interact with drug molecules in order to give us some kind of effect that we want. And there are uh, so-called voltage-gated receptors which will, will, will be uh, activated based on a certain amount of electrolytes around it or ions. Ligand-gated, which, which would be activated after interaction with a specific molecule called a ligand. And G-protein-coupled, this one is far too complicated to discuss without 
you know, going outside basics. So uh, I'll just mention this for the sake of mentioning it alongside the other types of receptors. If you want to know more about this, go to your pharmacology or find some pharmacology texts or videos. We move forward to transport proteins. Basically, they transport something throughout the body or sometimes in the context of the cell, out and in the cell. So, for example, the most commonly mentioned transport protein in biochemistry and biology texts is hemoglobin. I think a lot of the, us already understand that hemoglobin's purpose is to carry oxygen and transfer it all around our body as if it's some kind of delivery service. Of course, we know that oxygen is required by every single cell in our body except some rare cells that can work without oxygen and is critical for our survival. Transferrin is an example of transport protein that carries fer, which means, well, iron, and uh, in, in combination with ferritin, they actually have a role in storing and utilizing iron for our body. Membrane channels and pumps are transport proteins in the context of transporting molecules in and out the cell. These are literally things which are embedded in the cell membrane that allow the entry of some molecules or ions or allow the exit of some. And uh, in fact, in pharmacology or in uh, higher levels of medical science or biology, biological sciences, this will be critical for the function of some drugs or even poisons of, or other relevant chemicals. Storage proteins are, well, as the word storage implies, store something. And usually they store something because they are not going to be used right off the bat. Ferritin, for example, again, I have mentioned a while ago, is something that stores iron, but um, for the purpose of just reserving it, because there, the, it's not always the case that we need to use all of the iron that we take from food at the moment. So whatever excess is stored, as well as myoglobin. Myoglobin stores excess oxygen in the muscle. Well, the clue is the prefix myo. And... Uh, a lot of people actually ex uh, interchange this, but they are definitely not the same. Hemoglobin carries oxygen for the purpose of delivering it to everywhere, and myoglobin just basically hoards the oxygen and stores it in our skeletal muscle. So that's a slight difference, and the only thing that's common to them is their capability to carry oxygen. Hormones are primarily, well, I could just imagine, I'm thinking right now, like, Almost all of the hormones that we study in physiology are peptide or at least made up of amino acids. And in fact, the only hormones that are not peptide or amino acid by structure are the steroid hormones and some other rare hormones. And I think a lot of us are familiar with these, insulin and glucagon, two of the main hormones that regulate our blood sugar. Insulin has the goal of decreasing our blood sugar and glucagon has the role of increasing blood sugar. And we will know more about these two things, these two hormones, when we go to carbohydrate metabolism. Also take note that if you've already studied some uh, physiology, most of the pituitary hormones are peptide by structure. So if you've ever studied of things like the growth hormone, the follicle-stimulating hormone, oxytocin, the antidiuretic hormone, every single one of those are actually peptide by structure. And in fact, if you've ever heard of things like nor nor epinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine. These are not technically peptides, but they are derivatives from individual amino acids. And we will have a special discussion of this, I can just imagine, in the future. Catalytic proteins are those that catalyze or speed up chemical reactions, and I'll discuss in the future why that is so important. And we call catalytic proteins as enzymes. Basically, anything that's made up of biomolecules and uh, speeds up some certain reactions in our body are called enzymes. And finally, defense proteins are primarily uh, exhibited or, 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 or wh what word should I use, are represented by the immunoglobulins, which actually, if you want another layman's term for this, are called the antibodies. So these are things which our body, specifically our white blood cells, a, a certain subtype of white blood cell, would produce in order to make sure that any kind of pathogen or, or foreign material that enters our system that should not enter our system would be taken care of the next time. And hopefully, 
would not anymore cause the disease it used to have. And this is, of course, the basis for our immunity against a lot of potential infectious diseases. And let me just say, etc., because, of course, there are probably a dozen more fun functions that are very special, but we cannot discuss anymore because it's not as commonly mentioned in general biochemistry texts.